Okay, uh, we haven't really talked too much about debt, which may surprise you in a personal finance course. Um, but to be honest, debt is kind of an easy idea, and I think people inherently do understand it fairly well. But there are a couple of key points we definitely want to cover here in this quick uh, discussion on debt. We're going to start out by talking about some of the simple stuff, okay? Consider this example. Somebody has student loan debt of $10,000 at 6.8% interest, credit card debt at 18.5% interest, and mortgage debt at 4% interest. So let's think about what they should do, okay? Given all of these debts that they face, some people will recommend that you use the waterfall method for paying off debt. This is actually an idea that Dave Ramsey uh, suggests that people should use. Uh, and you will learn that it is definitely not the ideal plan if you're going to pay off debt as quickly as possible. So under the waterfall method, you pay off all debt with a focus on the smallest debt first. Now, of course, anytime you've got debt like this, you want to make the minimum payment, right? Uh, so, for example, with credit card debt, you would always want to make the minimum payment to avoid fees for sure. But under the waterfall method, you would then prioritize based on the size of the debts. So, in order, the first thing you would do as you are aggressively paying these down is you would pay off the student loan debt first, then move on to the credit card debt, and then finally the mortgage debt. Dave Ramsey is a big believer that debt really in all forms should be avoided. And so anytime you're in debt, you wanna to try to pay it all off. This is the way he recommends. Can you see why this is a bad idea? It's a bad idea because you're going to accrue more interest over time if you pay off the student loan debt first, right? If you're paying off the credit card debt very slowly, the interest is going to eat you alive. Nonetheless, this is what Dave Ramsey recommends, and I can't necessarily fault him on this. His belief is that people uh, need emotional wins. What that means is people uh, are emotional beings, and they may not do real well to think about things mathematically. Instead, they need those emotional victories to help get them through. So for Dave Ramsey, the important thing is you pay off debt, okay? Once you are done paying off the student loan debt, it will feel so good that it will help you pay off debt beyond that. So target the small debts first so that it will improve the way you feel and incentivize you to continue paying off debts. Again, I can't really fault him for that belief, but you can see mathematically why that would be a problem. Um, my feeling is really the opposite in regards to personal finance, and this is because I'm dealing with people like you, people who are uh, financially disciplined and smart. Uh, and my belief is, I want to try to take the emotions out of it as much as I possibly can. I want to put myself in a situation where uh, I'm being very stoic. I'm using the best policies, and I'm not going to let my emotions uh, fudge those policies. Okay? So instead, I recommend something called the avalanche method, which is uh, kind of like a tongue-in-cheek reference to the waterfall method here. And the avalanche method is the method that I suspect you guys will want to employ as well if you have debt. And this is where you pay off the highest interest rates first. And this will save you a lot of money in the long run. I can prove it to you, but I suspect it's a pretty obvious thing, right? If you're paying off the highest interest rate first, you will stop that debt from growing, uh, which it can very quickly, right? If you're not paying on this $18,000 in debt, it's gonna grow very rapidly because of compounding interest. So the idea is you target the highest interest rates first. So for this person here, they will want to first target the credit card debt, then move on to the student loan debt, and then finally the mortgage debt. And that would be the method if literally all you're trying to do is pay off debt. Okay? We will see in a second that maybe paying off debt is not always the best idea. 
All right, so we started with the simple concepts of paying off debt. Now let's get into a more complicated idea, and this is definitely something that you need to know, okay? Um, considering this example here, let's say you've got student loan debt, which is charged at an 8.5% interest rate, and you also borrow money to buy a car at a 7.5% interest rate, okay? Not something I would generally recommend, but maybe you're willing to pay that much for uh, your car. So think about it. Which of these should you pay off first? Well, if you use the avalanche method, your thought process would be to pay off the student loan debt first. But can you think of a reason why this might need to be a more complicated decision? What is unique about student loan debt? It's an above the line deduction. So what that means is, Despite the fact that you were paying a 8.5% interest rate, the interest payments that you make are tax deductible. In other words, if you pay $1,000 in interest payments to that student loan debt, you're not really paying $1,000 because it will reduce your taxable income by a thousand bucks, okay? On the other hand, auto loan, can't deduct that, all right? So you will fully pay the 7.5%. We needed something to help us make this decision. So we're going to use something called the effective interest rate. This is not really a technical term. Uh, it's just the one that I like to use when we're talking about this idea. Uh, the effective interest rate is the interest rate you pay. Let's think about it first in, in terminology and then we'll do the math. This is the interest rate you pay after fully considering the tax implications. Okay, so when you pay that 8.5%, it won't really be like 8.5% once all the dust settles and you've paid your taxes, okay? So we can use a formula. I think this is the last formula you're going to have in this class. Uh, the effective interest rate is the quoted interest rate, I'll say, right? It's the interest rate that you are going to see on your forms, 8.5%. Right? It's the interest rate that is listed times 1 minus the tax rate. Right? So we can use this formula to help us make a decision. The taxes we need to consider are both the U.S. and Georgia income taxes. Medicare, Social Security taxes, those aren't really ever deductible in regards to debt. Okay, So those things aren't relevant. But what is relevant is to recognize then when I make contributions here, when I pay my student loan debt, I save Georgia and federal income taxes. When I pay this, I don't. So I need to make sure that I'm anticipating that difference. So let's say for this example, all right, going back to this example up here, let's say that the marginal tax bracket that they are in is 22% for the U.S. and 5.75% for Georgia. I use these rates because for a lot of people, those are the rates that they face. Um, that's kind of like an, a middle upper class uh, tax rate that you might face, you know, when you have a family or maybe right after uh, you get your first job. So those are often tax rates that are most applicable to people, okay? So what that means is when you pay $100 towards this, you're gonna save 22% of that $100 because it will come back to you due to reduced income. Okay, let, let me make sure we understand this. If I make a $100 payment, all right, what that does is it reduces my income, taxable income, by $100. And let me be clear. When I say $100 payment, let me be very clear here. Um, sorry. When I make a $100 interest payment, if you're paying down the principal, that doesn't do anything, all right? It's the interest payments that reduce your taxable income, all right? All of this is kind of complicated, but the math is going to show us very clearly what we need to do, all right? But just to make sure we understand the logic, if I make $100 in interest payments, this will reduce my taxable income by $100. So I will pay $22 less in U.S. income, okay? My taxable income goes down by $100, so I save 22% of what I put in, and I will also pay $5.75 less in Georgia taxes. So all told, my $100 that I paid towards this debt 
in regards to interest will only actually cost me $22, I'm sorry, will only actually cost me $72.25, okay? I make $100 in payments, but the government gives me $27.75 back, reducing my taxable income, okay? So all that's well and good, but it's the math here with the effective interest rate that is going to most clearly show us what's going on. So what we're going to do is, to solve for the effective interest rate, we're going to use that student loan interest rate of 8.5% and multiply it times 1 minus the tax rate. All right, I'm going to just go ahead and combine those taxes there. All right, I'm just adding these two up because this is the taxes that I'm going to effectively save. I don't have to pay them for income that goes towards uh, student loan debt. So doing the math here, and what you'll get is about 6.14%. So on that student loan debt, the interest rate that I really pay is only 6.14%. The effective interest rates on the auto loan is going to be 7.5% because there's no tax, there's nothing here to reduce. I don't save any taxes on that because none of it's tax deductible. Every time I make a payment towards an auto loan, I fully lose that money. I don't get any kind of rebate from the federal government. So the effective interest rate on the student loan will be 6.14%, and the effective interest rate on the auto loan will be 7.5%. So the end result here is, if I want to reduce my overall expenses, I should pay off the auto loan first. It's the effective interest rate that should drive your decision, not your overall interest rate. This is definitely something that is valid and something you should consider. I find that when I talk to people about their own personal finances, they, they don't even think about this. It never even enters their mind to consider the tax ramifications. But certainly you should think about it this way. So your last bit of math for this class, effective interest rate. All right, to wrap things up, uh, I basically just want to take everything we've been talking about, all these complicated issues, and try to boil it down into just the big picture, right? Thinking about our personal finances as a collective strategy. And I, and I want to thank you guys for doing a good job in this class, staying up to date with everything. These summer classes are crazy in terms of how fast you have to move. So I appreciate you guys sticking with it um, and working so hard. So to close things out, no math here or anything. Probably put down your pencil, just pay attention, and learn a little bit about how you should think about your overall life strategy, okay? There's nothing really new here. It's all about just connecting ideas. So if we think about it here, I would say that there's, there's really four things to keep in mind, four primary goals of personal finance. We're going to try to take the complex ideas and boil them down into primary ideas. I think this is personal finance in a nutshell, all right? You got to figure out a way to earn more, save more, invest strategically, and choose a goal, all right? So when you're earning more, when you're saving more, when you're doing all of this, keep a goal in mind in terms of what you're trying to do. So let's think about what we can do to improve our odds of satisfying each of these goals. Let's start with earning more. A lot of you guys are already past this step, but definitely choosing a major, a lucrative major. I think a lot of times we are told to follow our dreams. Um, I don't necessarily think that's really all that good of advice, to be honest. I, I think it's kind of a, a unreasonable advice in a way. Um, following your dream is a good idea when your dream makes money, but if you're, 
If your dream is going to put you tremendously in debt and ruin your life, well, then don't follow that dream. So I would say adjust that to find a dream that allows you to live the life you want to live. Um, you don't have to be a slave for money, certainly, but you do need to think about the money that's available to be paid to you. Okay, so choose a major based on what sort of lifestyle you're hoping to have. Don't totally ignore how much money you can make because that obviously matters. As for raises, as you get a job, you know, over time, what you're going to find is that uh, there are going to be situations where you're offered a raise and it's just given to you. That's great. But there are also going to be times where you probably should ask for a raise. Think about what a business does. A business goal is to maximize profits. And to maximize profits, that means to maximize revenues and minimize cost. For a company, you're a cost. So it is up to them, really, to pay you as little as possible, right? If they're trying to maximize their profits, their goal should be to pay you as little as possible. Pay you just enough to keep you around. So what you gotta do is ask for a raise. You're gonna be worth more to your company than they're paying you most of the time. You're profitable for the company. So you need to ask for raises. And in order to do that, that often means you have to apply for jobs. Get a job offer at another company, right? Apply for jobs, see what you're worth. You may be surprised by what sort of offerings that you get. And this is probably advice that's best suited for the women in the class. Uh, you know, there's, there's this famously, there's this male female uh, income gap very complicated subject actually to talk about, uh, but it does appear that part of the income gap is explained by the fact that males are more likely to seek alternate employ employment and more likely to ask for raises. They're more likely to negotiate for higher salaries. Now, why are males more likely? I don't know. It could be systemic discrimination that led them to do that. I don't know. But the bottom line is this is something we can all do and do often to improve our overall uh, chance of reaching retirement. You know, making an extra $1,000 a year is a big deal once you consider the, the potential compounding interest you could gain off that $1,000. I would encourage you to talk about money. There's many reasons to do this. One, it helps you get better at it. Find friends that will talk, to, talk about money with you. You will learn from them. They'll learn from you. Uh, it will motivate you to talk about money. All right, If you know that your friends are saving money, that might help you feel good about saving money as well. So talk about money. Find out what your coworkers are, are earning. Um, you might be, find out that you're underpaid. So I would say let's, let's remove the taboo from this subject. Make it something you talk about. Otherwise, your, your lessons are going to go away, right? It's kind of like learning a foreign language. If you learn a foreign language in college and then you don't use it anymore, your skills go away. Same deal here. Talk about money. Give yourself a chance to learn about money through communication. Don't make it a taboo subject in your mind. Discuss it with people that you trust. And then the last one here, hustle when you're young. Make as much money as you possibly can when you're young. I'm not telling you how to live your life, but what I should definitely, one, one takeaway you should get from this class is just to recognize that the time value of money is a big deal. And the younger you are with your money saving, the more years you have of compounding interest. Okay, If you can just save you know, $5,000 today, if you can get 7% interest, let's say that's like the real interest rate, right? 7% interest. If you could save that money today when you're 20 years old in 45 years, let's see how much that would be worth. Over $100,000. I know you guys know this, right? You know how to make these calculations. But just mathematically, let's make sure that we conceptualize this properly. Let's understand why this is important. So when you are 20 years old, you could save $5,000 and turn that into about $100,000 in real money, in, in, in inflation-adjusted money, when you are 65 years old. If instead, at age 50, you save $5,000, That would only be worth about 14,000 bucks. Okay? So what's the lesson here? You know, I don't want you guys to think that, that what I'm telling you is you should just save all your money and you shouldn't spend, you shouldn't have fun. I, I think the lesson here is to think about how money is used over time. Okay? 
If you save a dollar today, you can spend $10 20 years from now. That's what this is telling you, okay? Saving $5,000 today is worth so much. And saving $5,000 in the future is really not going to be worth that much to you during your retirement years. So what that means is you should be scratching and clawing for savings right now. And that often means earning as much money as possible right now, all right? I host trivia. I host trivia at a bar. I get paid about $2,000 a year. I got some friends that are wealthy. They make fun of me. They're like, why, why are you doing all this work for $2,000? Well, one, I like it. But two, $2,000 is worth a lot to me because I'm not spending it. If I spent that $2,000, yeah, it'd be gone, right? I'd get some fun out of it, but it'd be gone. But if I save that $2,000, it's going to add up, right? That $2,000 in 45 years might be worth forty dollars or $50,000 to me, right? That's a lot of money. So when you're young, it's more important that you earn money and also more important that you save it. So earning more is a big deal, especially when you are younger. And all the research shows that those first few years out of college not only are important in terms of saving, but also they tend to be very predictive of your future salary. So you should work really hard in those first few years if possible. I'm not saying don't go on vacations, you know. I'm not saying you shouldn't spend. I'm just saying you should understand the consequences of your actions. The more you save now, the less you have to save later on. So saving more, all right? It's not just about earning. It's also about uh, reducing your spending. That's kind of obvious, and there's not a whole lot to talk about here. Uh, but what I would uh, like to make mention of now is budgeting. We've gone through this entire class without talking about budgeting at all. Uh, and that's because I, I think budgets are, I think they're overrated as a personal finance tool. And I think they are, they fit more in line again with like the Dave Ramsey crowd, the people who really need that help. Uh, I don't think people who are graduating from Georgia College and taking personal finance in general are not, are, are really the type of people that have to budget. Research shows that budgeting creates some pretty big problems. It actually creates financial stress in some cases because it really puts you in a bind. If you feel like you have to stick to the budget, it basically increases stress, all right? And secondly, if you feel like you have to stick to the budget, it actually might cause you to spend more, you know? You're looking at your budget and you said, well, I would spend $200 on, on fun this month. Well, I've only spent 100. Oh, I need to spend this money to fit into my budget. If you're taking a budget literally, that's the approach you should take. So what I would say is use a budget if you want. I've got no problem with them. If it helps you, then absolutely do it. Some people really like budgets, lots of smart people. But what I would recommend in addition to a budget or perhaps in replacement of the budget is to automate your savings. I think it's really uh, a non-issue to say that savings is, is the important part of your earning, right? If you think about your, your overall life in terms of improving your happiness later on, it's all about how much you can save, okay? So what I would recommend is automate your savings. Take the thinking process out of it entirely. You know, instead of trying to figure out how much can I spend, which is a budget-minded approach, instead of thinking about how much can I spend and what should I spend on, uh, basically force yourself to save. And this is really easy to do. You're, you're kind of putting, putting the dog back in front of the tail here, right? If you think that saving is really the most important thing, put it first, all right? So your income goes automatically to, you know, 401ks, HSAs, or whatever else you decide to put money into. Think about how much this would reduce your, your stress in your life. Basically, you can think of it this way. If you could put $1,000 a month into a 401k, you will be wealthy in the future, right? If you could put $1,000 a month into your 401k, you will be wealthy in the future. Think about how much this reduces your stress because what that means is if you have this automatic contribution occurring, you basically can just spend all the rest if you want. You don't have to worry about budgets. You already have satisfied your savings. This is going to accomplish it right here. So everything else is really up to you at that point. This is going to make your life so much simpler, right? We know that financial stress is a big deal. It ruins marriages 
It creates unnecessary strife. It keeps you up at night. Well, take away the stress. Put your savings first and your spending second, okay? I've heard the, the adage before, you should pay yourself first. Uh, that's, that's great advice, right? Pay your future self first by putting your money into savings because not only is that going to make you feel better, but that's going to make you wealthy in the long run because of compounding interest. All right, so budgets, fine. Got no problem with budgets. Use them if they help you. But what I would say is automate your savings. It's going to make life so much easier for you if money is directly going into your HSA, 401k, or whatever other plan you might choose. Three, investing strategically. This is the easy one, isn't it? And this is part of what we learned in this class, that investing is really not all that complicated. Um, what you're going to try to look for is a balance between stocks and bonds. Probably what you're going to want to do is you're going to uh, start out when you first start saving money significantly. You're going to put almost all of your money in the stocks, all of your savings in the stocks. And over time, you're going to transition more into bonds to reduce risk. So you're going to want to balance and you're also going to want to think about rebalancing which is something we covered in the past, right? If stocks are doing really well, well then your portfolio is gonna have a higher share of stocks. So you'll wanna sell stocks, buy bonds. That's rebalancing, okay? So you wanna think about balancing your portfolio to maintain the level of risk that you want. I would say probably use index funds in your investing, right? Maybe that's a little bit controversial. Mutual funds can be okay too, but research shows that index funds have outperformed actively managed mutual funds uh, over the last several decades. So I would recommend putting money into index funds to avoid fees. Definitely you want to understand how fees work. That's something that the general public doesn't know about, but it's really not so hard, is it? You know how expense ratios work now, right? So look into those fees when you're investing. Really, the, the overall thing to consider here, uh, in addition to the investing choices that you're making, is of course, think about taxes, right? Think about your tax strategy. Do you want to go traditional? Do you want to go Roth? Um, you know, are, are you holding your, your stocks long enough in a taxable account so that you earn qualified dividends instead of ordinary dividends? That stuff can get complicated, but it doesn't have to, right? You get your first job, automatic, set up that $500, $200,000 contribution to your 401k every single month and then just let it grow, okay? All right, so you wanna to try to earn more, save as much as you possibly can within reason, invest strategically. You've got these goals in mind. I think you guys all understand those goals pretty well. And I'm intentionally leaving this one as the last one for you. Choose a goal. This is maybe the hardest one. And from talking to really smart people, right? It, there's a bit of a problem here with this personal finance class. The people who need this class the most don't take it, right? Because they're not interested in finance. You guys are already, you know, on the right path. You're already probably responsible. So you guys usually do pretty well with one, two, and three. I talked to, to students from the past and they're saving lots of money, right? They're making really good choices. It's this fourth one here that I think is often the hardest. Choosing a goal. Now, what is a goal? The goal could be buying a really nice car. The goal could be buying a really nice house. Right? Those are goals that not everyone's going to have, but some people will. And you can't tell people what's right and what's wrong. Obviously, a goal that we probably all have is retirement. The bottom line is, whatever your goal is, is going to influence what your choices should be up here. For example, if you want to buy a $50,000 truck using cash, well then 401k contributions aren't going to work because you can't withdraw from a 401k to buy a truck. So your goal is going to influence the choices that you make. And so maybe the, the most important goal to think about here is your target retirement age. No way to know for sure when you're going to retire, but you should do your best to try to estimate it. Because think of it this way. Retiring at 55 versus retiring at 65 may not seem like such an important life choice right now, but it's a choice you have to immediately consider. If you're going to retire at age 55, what that means is you would really like to make some traditional 457B contributions. You would really like to stay traditional 
with your investments in general. Because what that means is if you retire at age 55, there's gonna be several years there before social security kicks in. Several years where your income is zero. So you would like to be earning some income then by withdrawing from traditional accounts when your tax burden is very low. Okay, you can basically withdraw some money at age 55 and pay no taxes on it once you consider the standard deduction you can get, right? Compare that to working until 65, or let's say, be more extreme, until 75. Well, now you probably want to go rough with a lot of your contributions because by the time you retire, Social Security is going to kick in almost immediately. So this is what I mean when I say choose a goal. I know it's hard to think about when you're going to retire right now, but think about what your goals are because that's going to influence all of these choices you're going to make. All right? If you know you're going to retire early, you've also got to be trying to save more. And if you're going to be retiring earlier, that might affect your decision about risk. If at age 53, you're two years away from retirement, you probably need to invest in a way that is less risky than somebody who's going to be retiring much later on. So think about your goals. All right? And what I would say is, um, you know, really choose your own path. I get so frustrated when I talk to students about this stuff because a lot of times I can tell the wheels aren't spinning in their head. They're, they're not really thinking about their lives as their own lives. I had a student this past year tell me, well, my dad told me, you know, I better get used to working because there's no way I'm going to retire before 70 because of the way Social Security's set up. So like, what the hell are you talking about? You can retire whenever you want. You just got to save enough, right? You got to save enough to be able to retire. If you want to retire at age 40, you can do it. But what that means is you got to be saving a ton. You probably need to work really hard up until age 40 and save a ton and live very frugally. It can be done, right? But it's going to take a lot of effort. Obviously, you can work until age 80. You can do that. If you work until age 80, that's probably going to change how much you spend now. So choose a goal based on what you want to do. I know it's hard right now to make these choices, but it's time to start thinking about it because you're going to get that job. They're going to say, how much you want to contribute to your 401k? Do you want to go traditional? Do you want to go Roth? That's a tough choice to make. And you need to think about when you're going to be retiring to help make that choice. To close this up, I just want to talk real quickly about the pitfalls that I see, and this is kind of moving beyond the testable part of this class and just thinking big picture still, all right? The pitfalls that I see, this is the mistakes that I see from people who do not make good, good personal finance decisions, okay? The big mistakes I see, one, are in housing. People buying houses that are way too expensive for them. They do this because they think that housing is a good investment. It's not a good investment. The house you live in is not a good investment. All right? Choose a house based on your needs, your desires, what you want. That's totally fine. Or rent. But I would recommend do not go out there and buy a house based on where your life expects to be. Don't buy a house when you're 23 years old that's 3,000 square feet because you think you're going to have a family. Wait till you have a family and then buy a house because chances are by the time you do get a family, your desires, your needs, and even where you live may change. So I would say try to keep your housing costs low if possible. Now, if you absolutely love houses, if that's the big important thing to you, well then fine, that's totally fine. But if it's not something that you really care about, don't let society box you into the idea that you have to buy a big house out in the suburbs. Do what you wanna do. If you wanna live with your friends for several years, if you wanna live with your parents and save extra money, there's nothing wrong with that, okay? So that's where I see big mistakes a lot of times. Here's another place where I see them. And man, it really frustrates me, automobiles. People make really big mistakes when it comes to buying cars. Uh, if you love cars, again, this is not for you. If you're somebody whose entire goal in life is to get a nice car, fine. I've got no problem with that. But people get their first job, they start making real money, and then their thought process is, well, now I need a big car. Now I need an expensive car. You don't have to do that. You can keep using a cheap car, and people really aren't going to judge you for it, okay? Um, in regards to automobiles, automobiles are so much more expensive than people think. All right? Think about a $50,000 car, for example. You've got the price that you have to pay, right? So that's the obvious thing. You're going to pay $50,000 for this car. You're going to pay interest, most likely, because you're going to borrow money for that auto loan. And a lot of times, auto loans have high interest rates, uh, oftentimes after you get past that introductory 0% period. These are the obvious things. But the other things about a $50,000 car is, usually, they have bad gas mileage because a lot of times very expensive cars have big engines. 
So they have high gas, or rather low uh, miles per gallon in regards to the gas mileage. You have very high insurance costs. Oftentimes, but not always, you have poor resale value and you have high maintenance costs. All right, maybe you've thought about all these, but the bottom line is I've sat down and done the math and, and the costs are absolutely unbelievable of how much an expensive vehicle like this will actually cost you when you consider all the features. Um, part of the reason why the resale value on these is often not so good is because they have high maintenance costs. So if you have a very expensive car and five years later you try to sell it, consumers are gonna be worried that you're selling the car because you know there's problems with it and you know that those problems are very expensive, okay? Um, so there's just one more I wanna to add to this just to make sure you think about things in a strategic way. Um, if you have a very expensive car, you'll also need a garage uh, to put it in most likely because you're gonna feel compelled to do that. Now for a lot of people, they want a garage. I'm totally on board with that. But these things are expensive, and when you're young, it's not the time to be taking all these huge expenses. If you could have instead taken all of the extra money that you have in this and instead contributed it to like an HSA or 401k, I mean, you're, you're talking hundreds of thousands of dollars in future wealth. I'm completely fine with you making this decision, but know that it is a decision that you can choose to make or choose not to make. You can choose to buy a clunker. You can choose to walk. Right? You do not have to buy an expensive car. Let's move past that, uh, that feeling that society is going to dictate what we do. A third major pitfall is debt. All right, Debt can be an absolute disaster. I'm guessing in this class you're smart enough to not take on you know, big credit card debt or anything like that. But what I would also say in regards to debt, obviously you want to avoid it. But I would also say not at all costs. Think about interest rates on things like a mortgage, right? Interest rate on a mortgage right now might be 3.5%. The stock market on average returns 10%. So if you've got some money, let's say you've got $100 that you're trying to decide what to do with, you could use it to pay off a mortgage and you would effectively save yourself that 3.5% that you're paying. But you could also inside decide to invest that money in the stocks. And since stocks return on average 10% and mortgages is only going to essentially save you 3.5%, a lot of times it's actually better to allow that debt to maintain. So not all debt is bad, okay? I suspect mathematically that idea should make sense to you, right? If I, if I give you $1,000 at a 1% loan, that's not really bad debt, is it? Because you can take that $1,000 and invest it into bonds and virtually guarantee yourself a profit. So debt, avoid it when it's high interest rate debt, but not always avoid it because in some cases debt is okay to have, right? To take all of this together um, and give you just one last term, think about this idea of lifestyle inflation. Think about the life you're living right now as a college student, right? Very cheap, very cheap life. And I bet you're actually really happy with your very cheap life. I bet you're enjoying yourself, right? You're seeing your friends a lot. You're doing fun stuff. You, you got a real, a real tight social group, chances are. Um, that often is hard to do later in life when you have a family, uh, when your work is really taking up a lot of your time, etc. So think about it. Right now, if you are happy, why do you need to spend more money? Right? If you're happy right now, why not allow this style of life you're living right now to maintain for a few more years? Lifestyle inflation is the idea that life perpetually becomes more expensive as you get accustomed To earning and spending money. And certainly lifestyle inflation to some extent is a natural and reasonable thing to happen, right? As your income goes up over time, well at some point it totally makes sense that your spending would go along with that. But what I would recommend is to delay this as long as you can because as we know those first few years out of college are going to be incredibly important in determining your future. 
Those first few years is where you have the chance to save money with the most amount of years of compounding interest. Okay, so try to delay lifestyle inflation the best you can. The whole point of money really is to make your life better. And if you're happy now with the lifestyle that you have, you don't need to feel obligated to ramp up your spending just because your income increases. So basically, this is what I, I try to do in my own life. I try to stay a few years behind, okay? What I mean by that is, when I got my first job when I was 20, I was 27 when I got my first real job out of grad school. What I tried to do was, when I hit that 27 year, I tried not to think about that huge wage increase that I got at age 27 until I was about 30. So it's like I'm, I'm, year, I'm living on three years salary from the past. And in doing so, my income rises at a faster rate than my spending. My spending is going up, but I try not to think about how much my income is going up over time, if that makes sense. That's just kind of a way I trick myself into trying to avoid lifestyle inflation. Maybe you have, you have your own way of doing that. But the easiest way, perhaps, is just to automate your savings. When you get that first job and you're thinking to yourself, I really want to save five grand this year, just set it up in the system. Set it up in your pay, paycheck that $5,000 comes out automatically, okay? But the bottom line is I think we all know people like this, right? We know people who spend every dollar that they have, and they're not any happier. So delay that gratification a little bit. It will make you feel so much more comfortable, so much more at ease uh, if you know that you've got that money saving and growing over time. All right, that's partially my opinion, but I really want to push you guys on the right path because I want you guys to have good lives. I hope you've enjoyed this class. I know it's an absolute rush getting through all this material in such a short period of time. I think this class is so much better in person, but I hope you got something out of it, uh, and I hope that it hasn't been too painful. So thank you guys so much for taking the course.